Welcome to today's sponsored webinar by OFX and hosted by CPA Australia. This webinar will provide an overview of exotic currencies versus major currencies. My name is Gavin Ord and I am the Business and Investment Policy Manager here at CPA Australia. We have people joining us from all over the world for today's webinar and I welcome you each and every one of you to today's webinar. Importantly, I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners from around Australia and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend this acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be joining us for today's webinar. It's now my pleasure to invite James Greff, Head of Pricing and Commercial Finance, Asia Pacific at OFX, and Samuel Pitt, Account Manager, Partnerships and Enterprise at OFX. Today, we'll be taking questions through the Q&A box. Please direct those questions to all panelists. We'll also be addressing the questions throughout the session, so please get your questions in so we can ask them throughout the session. For any troubleshooting queries, please send the message to the host in the chat box. It's now time for our session to commence, so I'll hand over to James and Samuel. Thank you, James and Samuel. Many thanks, Gavin. It's great to be here, and, and hi everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm sure we'll uh, we'll all get something very valuable out of this session. Uh, it's great to be um, with you here today with James Greff, our head of pricing and commercial finance. Um, just in terms of the agenda for this afternoon, um, we're just going to go over some basics: international money transfers, and then we're going to take a, a deep dive into the major versus exotic currencies. Um, looking at some differences, looking at some case studies, looking at some use cases. Um, we'll be looking at, uh, in particular, the PHP, the INR and the, uh, the, the Chinese currencies. And then we're going to finish off looking at some trends that we've seen uh, over the past 18 months uh, and, and look at some insights there. Um, just for those of you who don't know, uh, my name's Samuel Pitt. I'm the CPA Account Manager here at OFX. Uh, I've been playing this game, uh, which I very much enjoy since about 2018. And I look after our CPA members uh, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, um, so it's always good fun. Um, prior to this, I was I was working in the banks, and and I was a solicitor before that. Now um, we will just jump forward to the next slide, um, just to set the set the scene and, and create a bit of context here. Now I'm hoping most of you uh, on the webinar this afternoon. Do know a little bit about OFX, but for those who don't, um, I might just give you a, a small introduction. So, I suppose um, before the advent of the internet, uh, some sort of 20 years ago, for example, the only way to move funds offshore or receive funds uh, onshore uh, was obviously through the banks. And, and I guess um, doing this was, was always a bit difficult because there was a timely, uh, costly, um, exercise and banks were very good at charging fees and and there was the currency market was always shrouded in some sort of um, mystery for example for some reason anyway uh, about 20 years ago um, Matt Gilmore and Gary Lord um, came up with this idea that you know they, they identified the gaps in the market and they thought well let's educate uh, educate the people about about foreign currency how it works and and try and dispel some of those myths and so at about that time they they came up with a, an information service for want of a better expression and 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 they did just that they they educated you know the Australian population as to how it all works and fast forward to 2013 that uh, that information service really did become uh, a platform where where you know people could actually facilitate international payments um, in 2013 OFX listed on the Australian Stock Exchange and now we're looking at uh, eight operations around the world our second largest operation being in London in the UK, um, and and so obviously the the, the latest uh, office to open was uh, was in Dublin to to service our European uh, cohort. So it's all terribly exciting, and and you know it it all stem it all really stems down to the fact that um, we know with this twenty years of experience, um, it's all about providing uh, that expertise and knowledge, and and as I said, dispelling dispelling the uh, the myths around foreign currency transactions. Now, at this point, I'd like to um, to introduce you to James Greff. Um, James is our head of pricing here at uh, Asia Pacific and uh, an accountant himself. He uh, he knows all the, the bits and pieces and uh, intricacies of, of 
foreign currency. So um, welcome, James, and I might hand over to you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Great. So what we thought we might do is we'll start with some basics on how transferring money internationally actually works. So let's take a look at this example on the top of the page here, number one. <clears throat> so in this case, we've got an Australian individual that wants to sell, say, some Google shares in the USA and wants to bring the money back home to Australia. So step one, what will happen is the individual transfers the US dollars to OFX's bank account in the US or whoever they're choosing to be their money transfer partner. And step two, OFX pays Australian dollars out of our Australian bank account to the individual's Aussie bank account. Now, the interesting thing here is that no actual transfer of funds cross-border by OFX takes place in this case. We call this netting, and this happens roughly over 50% of the time because companies like OFX have licenses to operate and bank accounts in multiple locations around the world. In example two on the bottom of the page, we've got an Australian business that's looking to pay a supplier in the USA. In this case, in step one, the business sends Australian dollars to OFX Australia's bank account. And in step two, OFX sends US dollars from our US bank account to the American supplier. Again, no actual cross-border transfer takes place here. Just wanted to also cover off a bit of terminology on the right here. Uh, we use the term currency pair to refer to the two currencies being exchanged. From a client's perspective, in example one, they're selling or sending US dollars and they're buying or receiving Australian dollars. Recipient sometimes referred to as beneficiary, is the person or the entity that receives the funds. Client rate is the agreed personalised exchange rate for the US dollar to Aussie exchange. And market rate, which sometimes you'll hear referred to as the interbank rate, is the exchange rate paid by banks when they trade currencies with each other. And that rate is constantly moving. So we go to the next page, thanks Sam. Great, so let's turn our mind to the differences between major and exotic currencies and the differences between them. Thanks, James. So we, we have a quick poll here. Um, actually, I'll just... Bring up the correct slide. So we have a quick poll here. Um, what percentage of all foreign exchange transactions in 2020 involved the US dollar? So we've got the, the timer on there. You'll see the, uh, the polling questions have come up in the right-hand panel there. A, 33%, B, 50%, C, 75%, or D, 88%. So that question again, what percentage of all foreign exchange transactions in 2020 involved the US dollar? Have a think about that. Time's almost up. Right. Let's have a look. Now let's see how sharp everyone is. So it seems to be the overwhelming majority thought it might be 75%. Well, let's have a look at the next slide and see what the actual answer was. Yep, so the answer is actually 88% if you count both sides of the foreign exchange transfer, which is pretty, uh, pretty high, right? So let's say, think about major currencies. So major currencies, including the US dollars, are those currencies that make up most of the world's foreign exchange transfers. So collectively, they represent about 85% of the FX market. So these currencies are highly liquid or easy to exchange around the world. And common convention says that the majors are US dollars, euros, British pounds, Japanese yen, Swiss francs, Canadian dollars, Aussie dollars, and New Zealand dollars. Sometimes you hear Swedish kroner is also referred to as a, a major, depending on who you're talking to. Now, the, the interesting thing here is in practice within the FX industry, each player might have a slightly different list of majors, and that list aligns to the countries where they have their own bank accounts. So, for example, here at OFX, we also refer to Hong Kong dollars and Singapore dollars as majors, as we have offices and bank accounts and licenses in those countries. 
and these currencies are very liquid for us. Exotics, on the other hand, refer to all the other currencies. And these currencies are therefore thinly traded or much less liquid. Because there's fewer transfers, these currencies tend to be more volatile, meaning their exchange rate can move lots and move rapidly. So they're harder to manage for an FX player. And that's why you'll typically see higher fees for transfers involving an exotic currency. We'll just go to the next page. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so what we wanted to do now is just jump a little deeper into three example exotic currencies and leave you with a couple of tips or things to watch out for. All right, so we'll start with the Philippines peso. So this currency is ranked number 30 on the most traded currency list, and it's got around 0.3% share. It's a free floating currency. Now you remember that I said earlier that over half of OFX transfers are netted. That is, they don't actually require a cross border transfer. Well, for exotic currencies like PHP, most FX players don't have licenses or in-country operations and bank accounts in these currencies and therefore a real cross-border transfer into the Philippines is required. So we do this through one of our 14 global banking partners by buying PHP from them and we send them US dollars. And then we send on that PHP to the client's bank account in the Philippines. With exotics, there's commonly more barriers to trading. Um, there's limited money transfer players in Australia that can transfer PHP to Australia as they don't have a PHP bank account in the Philippines, meaning PHP is commonly a one directional currency. I, it's very easy to send Australian dollars to the Philippines, but not the other way around. Another common barrier to trading exotics is the inability to hedge or to enter a forward contract. This is because there's so much volatility and uncertainty with the future FX rates that again, most players choose not to take on that additional risk and offer that product. In terms of speed of transfer, 80% of OFX PHP transfers occur within an hour and in some cases as little as minutes. Across the industry though, this can be as long as five days. And just a tip for you here to remember around exotics and, and PHP, when you're thinking about speed, always be mindful of the weekends and public holidays in the country you're sending your money to, as this can slow things down. In fact, FX markets are actually shut on the weekend and commonly exotic transfers can't be booked on a weekend. So we go to the next page and we'll take a look at the Indian rupee. So this currency is uh, number 18 on the most traded list it's got around half a percent share. It's technically a free floating currency. However, what happens here is the Reserve Bank of India manipulates the FX rate by buying and selling rupees on the open market. So we call this a managed floating currency. Similar to PHP, where an individual is looking to send money to India, there's typically a cross-border transfer. So in our case, OFX would purchase INR from one of our banking partners and then send that INR to the recipient's bank account in India. An additional common barrier for INR transfers is that depending on the path or the rails that the money transfer operator uses, there could be a maximum limit for INR. So this maximum limit is commonly one and a half million INR which equates to around 28,000 Australian dollars per transfer for a corporate client and the limits imposed by the Reserve Bank of India. In our case, we have a choice of a rails to use. So we actually effectively have no maximum limit. And a tip for you, if you're thinking about doing an INR transfer, you're gonna need your 11 digit Indian financial system code, which is a bit like uh, our BSB. So when you set up your recipient for the first time round and type in their details, you'll need to put in your IFC code. And you can get that from uh, your bank's check or passbook, or you can just Google the bank's website. 
if we flip over. Thanks, James. <clears throat> um, so now it's time for our next poll question. Um, there are two Chinese currencies, CNY and CNH. Which one of these currencies is traded offshore? So again, the poll question uh, is, there are two Chinese currencies, CNY and CNH. Which one of those currencies is traded offshore? The response is uh, A, CNY, B, CNH, C, both, D, none, on the right-hand side of your screen there. Time is almost up. And we'll see what, um, what the responses were. All right, so everyone thinks it's CNY. James, what do, you, what do we think the answer might be? Yep, so the answer is actually CNH. So the Chinese currency is a little more complex. So let's, let's get into this. So uh, firstly, to start us off, let's think about England as a comparison country. So their currency is officially called the pound sterling and the unit of currency is called a pound. And in their case, the ISO standard code is GPB, which stands for Great British Pounds. For China, renminbi is the official name of the Chinese currency and yuan is the unit of currency. But they actually have two types of yuan. They have a CNY and a CNH. So CNY is traded in mainland China and it's government controlled. The Chinese government sets a daily reference rate by referencing a basket of 24 currencies. CNH is used in FX marketplaces outside of mainland China, places like Hong Kong and London and Singapore. And a good way to remember the difference is the H in CNH actually stands for Hong Kong. CNH is largely set by market forces, certainly in comparison to CNY. So if you're, if you're an Aussie business looking to pay a Chinese supplier based in the mainland in China, you'll need to pay the invoice in CNY. And with CNY, there's a few extra requirements you've got to think about. And if you don't meet these requirements, there can be a delay or even a rejection of your transfer. So commonly there's extra scrutiny on larger transfers from the Chinese government, which often means that FX companies impose a maximum limit per transfer. So in our case, as an example, for businesses, we have a 500,000 CNY online limit, but you can get, you can transfer larger amounts if you call through to, to one of our dealers who can help navigate the system. Also for CNY, you're going to need your beneficiary's invoice number. So what we do here is we, we enter that invoice number into the reference field and that helps at the other end when your payment arrives. And the third thing you're going to need for CNY is your beneficiary's CNAPS or China National Advanced Payment System number. Again, that's a bit like a BSB code. If you don't have those things, your payment can be rejected. Okay. Let's get into the next section then, if we can, Sam. So what we wanted to do here is just... Sorry, sorry James, I was just going to ask a question on the um, yep. Chinese currency. So currently it's considered an exotic, um, but obviously yep. it's it's the second largest economy in the world. When, when, do you might, when do you see possibly the Chinese currency becoming a major currency? You know, what, 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 would they need, what would China need to do to get to that stage? Yeah, good question. Look, I think the answer is probably going to be a few years at least. Um, so while it's definitely true that the Chinese government has relaxed some controls over time over their currency, uh, the currency is not yet fully floating and freely traded. And to be a major currency, you really got to have high liquidity and be highly stable over a long period of time. So I think it's going to be a while off. But definitely you're seeing more central banks in, in many countries stockpiling that currency now as, as a reserve. I think up to 70 central banks are now keeping some CNY or CNH in, the, in their portfolio. And just a bit of a follow-up question, um, maybe to Sam. Uh, when, 
what situations do you see businesses um, wanting to do the, uh, these trades with, say, the Philippines and India? Because I assume that most most of those transactions are still normally done in US dollars. But when what situation would they might um, a bit Australian business or a Singapore business might need Philippine pesos or Indian rupees? Again, Gavin, good question. Um, what we've been seeing lately, and we will sort of cover the uh, the trends that we've been seeing in a little minute, but um, but certainly a lot of the PHP, the Filipino peso payments, we're seeing um, you know a lot of Australian businesses, um, especially during COVID, you know, having to outsource their 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 workforce. So we're seeing a lot of Australian businesses with a large workforce in, say, Manila, and having to pay their their workforce in in local currency. Um, so you know that's a good example of, of where we're seeing a lot of, of demand for PHP, and and you know the demand has actually increased to a point where OFX and, and all sorts of other providers are having to look at solutions to improve the delivery uh, for for local currencies like PHP because people are demanding uh, payments be faster, be um, cheaper, be you know all of these things um, to to keep up with the demand. So. Um, you know, and and like like I've said, um, also we're seeing a lot of uh, investors. You know, because what what we we all know Telstra have a, a large work workforce in in the Philippines, and not only do these investors have to be paid a salary, but they also are the recipients of uh, of shares. For example, Telstra shares, and so um, we're also seeing a, a real uptake in um, in in dividend payments, for example, uh, for these employee share plans. So, uh, so that's that's always very interesting. But we'll get into more some some more trends, especially in INR um, and CNY in the next slide, Gavin. Thanks, sir. You know, just to tack on to part of your question there, Gavin. I think you're asking how common is it for Australian businesses to transfer US dollars to the Philippines, as an example. We don't actually see that very often. Uh, PHP is the main currency for them. You, you, you can go, if you're on holidays in the Philippines and you go into a tourist resort or something, you are able to use US dollars on the ground a little bit. That's actually less common than you might think in the business uh, payment of supplier type circumstance. Okay. So yeah, let's have a look at um, what we're seeing in our portfolio uh, to give you a bit of a flavor for what's happening in the market right now. So I'm going to focus on the right hand side of this chart, um, but I'm going to give you a bit of context first. So in 2020, when the first round of COVID-19 hit, what we saw globally across uh, the whole industry was a significant reduction in transfers, particularly for consumers. And that included transfers originated by Australians. We saw in many of our consumer use cases, they were negatively impacted. So things like holiday and travel, relocation, property investment, expat salary transfers in particular, they all went backwards. Now, interestingly, this year in 2021, of course, we're still seeing depressed holiday and travel related transfers, unsurprisingly, but we have seen a rebound in property investment, relocation and asset purchases. We've also seen that transfer sizes have have increased. And what that indicates is that Australians think there's less uncertainty and they've got higher confidence about the future and they're just getting on with things. For corporates or our SME clients, uh, the response to COVID has been less turbulent actually. So last year in 2020, uh, maybe a few discretionary large transfers were paused by companies, but by and large, normal business activity continued. In fact, last year, hedging activity via forward exchange contracts increased. And this year, what we're seeing is that that hedging activity is returning towards nor more normal levels. This year in 2021, corporate transfer deal sizes are a little higher, but not nearly to the same extent as what we're seeing with consumers. And then if we wanna turn our mind to exotics, which is on the next page. Let's have a look at, uh, and Sam 
covered some of this in his answer to, to Gavin, but if you have a look at INR on the left there, we are definitely seeing a greater number of transfers this year, but interestingly at lower transfer sizes. So our hypothesis here is that clients are continuing to support families in India throughout COVID, but that support has stabilized by a smaller but more frequent transfers. The PHP was seeing greater number of transfers, much greater number of transfers versus last year, and significantly uh, or similar deal sizes, just a little bit lower. So what we think hap is happening here is businesses are adapting to COVID, they're tweaking their business model, they're looking for lower cost workforces to, to supplement their business model. And so there's probably greater salary payments heading out of Australia to the Philippines to cover those expanding teams on the ground there. And then looking at CNY or CNH transfers, we're seeing about the same number of transfers as last year, but at significantly larger sizes. So what's happening here is that the pandemic has driven up freight costs as much as 300 and 400%. Plus, freight lead times have blown out. So what our Australian corporate clients are doing is they're ordering larger shipments less often so that they can minimise those freight costs. James, a question just come through from uh, from Kintan Shah. Um, thanks for the question, Kintan. The question is: lots of businesses ask for payments in USD in, instead of their home currency. Why is that? Is it because they want to take up the benefit of the exchange rate? Yep, yeah, that that's certainly very common, particularly for markets uh, where you have an exotic currency. The main reason, really, is just the US dollar, as we said before. 88% of trades involve the US dollar. It's just a more liquid uh, currency. It's more available. You can predict its price. You can get more reliable rates. If you want to hedge, like put in place a, a forward for the future to protect your underlying business, US dollar hedges are a lot easier to do. Sometimes in some cases that the fee from receipt from uh, banks that touch the transfer along the way is lower as well for US dollars. And I guess the last region, reason, Sam, is many businesses throughout COVID globally have started to sell more and more online. Uh, and some of those sales arrive in US dollars. So they're generating revenue in US dollars. So they may have US dollars on hand to actually make payments to suppliers in as well. James, I was, I was just going to say that that was a really interesting um, analysis around some of the trends you're seeing with your Australian clients, um, particularly uh, Philippines and China. Um, in clients in other jurisdictions, what sort of are you seeing any other other trends similar, or are you seeing different trends in other for your clients in other jurisdictions? Yeah, well, um, just looking at page fifteen here on the top right, that story of consumer transfer behavior is largely happening everywhere all around the world we see it in north america we see it in europe we're seeing it here in apac as well um, i suppose the only other thing i'd throw into the mix is that there's lots of turmoil happening on the ground in hong kong at the moment uh, as the chinese mainland is coming in and cracking down on kind of what they can do, freedoms, etc. We are seeing a flight of funds, particularly in the last 12 months or so, out of out of Hong Kong. So many well-off individuals in Hong Kong are sending funds to other locations, the UK, the US, even, even sometimes Australia, which is a reflection of what's happening on the ground geopolitically. And also, Gavin, interestingly, and I'm not sure why this might be, but obviously, like James covered before, property investment uh, transactions, you know, um, really declined, you know, beginning of COVID. But um, we've seen a huge uh, bounce back in, in that sector, and especially for property investment in, of all places, Vietnam. So we've seen a, a big uptick in, um, in the Vietnamese Dong sort of transfers. Um, obviously, the inheritance pieces, um, it's not a, a good news story, but um, we have seen 
a very difficult time of it with COVID and death and um, and so obviously inheritance um, transactions um, have, have increased, um, whereas relocation and asset purchase were were uh, on the on the decline. Thanks. That's that's really interesting. Now we should. Just, uh, I can just tack on another kind of theme we're seeing more generally across the industry, if you like. Um, you may have heard of multi-currency bank accounts, particularly for businesses, right? So I, I alluded to before the fact that more and more businesses are selling their product online, either via a marketplace like Amazon or on their own website. So that means they're getting sales in many countries around the world. So what's happening that's more and more common is you can open uh, a virtual multi-currency account. And typically those multi-currency accounts, you can hold or receive funds in a few different currencies. Like we have one here that's called the Global Currency Account. And in, in that product, you can hold US dollars, euros, Aussie, Hong Kong, Singapore dollars, Canadian dollars, pounds, and soon Japanese yen. The ones, these wallet type currencies, again, tend to be majors, right? The more liquid currencies. It's extremely rare to have an exotic currency as part of one of these multi-currency offerings. And what that means is with these multi-currency accounts is, it's just like having a local bank account in all those countries. Sometimes there can be higher fees for the, for the convenience, uh, but it allows you to receive revenue in all those currencies from your clients in those countries. James, another question's just come through. Uh, I think we've, we have covered it um, briefly before, but we might just um, cement it uh, here now again. Uh, uh, the question is, are exotic currencies subject to more volatility than major currencies? Uh, are, are products such as forward exchange contracts more expensive for exotics than major currencies? Yep. So yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, typically exotic currencies are more volatile than majors. Uh, the other thing also, if you remember the statistic that 85% roughly of FX transfers are for the majors, that only leaves 15% for all the exotic currencies. So there's not that many data points available in the market. So when somebody wants to price a forward, there's not actually that many data points to allow you to do that. So that combination of volatility, moving, meaning the exchange rate moves around a lot, and uncertainty about the future rate means that many players choose not to offer a forward product for exotics. Very good. So, so lastly, we're just um you know, have a, a, a snapshot of, the, of you know, the, the options available to to the consumer or corporate clients. Um, of course, we've got, we're looking at spot transfers, not just OFX, but across the board and, and across the industry. Um, so the options really are when you're looking at um, sending or receiving funds from overseas, you're looking at spot transfers where you're looking at an exchange rate on the day uh, where you want to buy or sell the foreign currency. Um, or you can obviously target a rate, it's what we call a limit order, where you can, uh, if you've got a bit more time up your sleeve, you can um, target a, a specific rate and then the provider will watch the market for you uh, and purchase the currency uh, when that rate is achieved. Um, and then obviously, like James has been talking about, forward exchange contracts, um, a very useful tool, a hedging tool, uh, where you can fix uh, a currency for a period of, 12 up to 24 months. Um, so obviously um, OFX can assist uh, everyone with, with all of these uh, types of transfers, uh, along with rate alerts, uh, apps, and, and daily and weekly commentary. Now I'm just having a look. Uh, I think there's another question that's just come through. James, the question was, um, OFX promotes rates. Um, where else can people get an exchange rate? That's a good question. Yeah, okay, thanks, Nan. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so that's true. We we definitely have. If you go to our homepage, you can see both the market rate and our standard client rates available there for you to have a look at. And then you can log in and get your personalised client rate. But if you just want to know the, the the market or the interbank rate at any time, I would try uh, Bloomberg or Reuters. Just search them online, and that they'll give you those rates. But if you want to make an actual transfer. You can, of course, go to your bank, the big banks. They do tend to be several times more expensive than, than players like us. Uh, there's actually many, many international money transfer operators available these days. But I'd probably say, do, you, do your research and find somebody that you trust, that's reliable, particularly if you're making a large transfer, you, you want peace of mind that it's going to arrive quickly and, and safely. And James, another question from Mark's just come through on the chat here. Uh, what are major alternatives to holding USD domestically in a major bank? What are major alternatives? Um, well, if you've got a US dollar account, bank account, that doesn't actually present any FX risk for you. But if you're in Australia and you don't have a US dollar account, you can either convert the funds to Australian dollars, being your local account, and just hold them in Australian, or you can uh, do your research on these multi currency accounts and you could potentially take one of those out. So, in that case, you might be able to find a multi currency account that has US dollars and Aussie, as an example. Mm, I think it's a good point. And, Mark, I, I think. Um... I mean, obviously, um, the process of opening a USD account, um, you know, is, is a process that you have to go through. Um, but if you're an Australian business, um, you might not, you know, be minded to sort of fly over or be in a position to fly over to the US and open the US uh, US account. So, um, like James was saying, that the multi currency account is definitely um, definitely your major alternative um, to uh, opening USD account. Uh, yourself and and again Florence uh, there's another question here James can we lock in rates or will it change now Florence I'm not um, not entirely sure how but, but, well, I can I can speak for our effects in terms of um, how, how we operate but um, when you when you enter a transfer on the RFX platform that's the time where the where the rate is locked so um, it doesn't matter, it, you know, obviously we'll ask you to fund the deal in 48 hours, but the, the, the deal is, is the rate is locked at the time that the deal is booked. Um, obviously, as we know, rates will change and constantly change, um, you know, as the market moves. Um, so um, that's where we that's where we assist with hedging products like limit orders and forward exchange contracts, where we, where we can look for more certainty in locking rates because like we said, uh, rates are changing constantly. Yeah, typical time frames for those forwards could be a year or even more sometimes if you want to go out into the future. Can I, can I just ask a question as well about um, are you, here you have your currency management tools. If we speak, we spoke about US dollar accounts and multi currency account bank accounts. Um, uh, is, it, is it possible, for example, to open up a, a CNY account in, a, in an Australian bank um, and help to manage that risk through, through those sort of um, those sort of foreign currency risks for those sort of accounts? Good question. You, if you're a Chinese national and you go to the Bank of China here in Australia, I think you can. You probably that can that way. Uh, but I'm not too familiar with if you can. I don't think you can at like major banks, right? I, back on the multi-currency account, I have seen one um, financial services player out there that does include CNY in their basket of currencies. But you know, if you look at their website, it's got the asterisks with a bunch of limitations. So I'm not sure how quality that profit product is. We don't offer a CNY multi-currency account. Thanks, James. I'll let you get back to the presentation. Thanks, Gavin. And um, Kaylin's um, come up with a uh, with a question here. Can I use your service while I'm in New Zealand? 
and only have a New Zealand bank account. Absolutely, Kaylin, you can use the service. Uh, we have an office in uh, in Auckland. Um, and so like James um, went through at the beginning of the presentation, um, the way a transfer would work in New Zealand, if you were to send funds to Australia, for example, um, you would book the deal on the OFX platform. You would do a domestic transfer from your New Zealand dollar account to our New Zealand dollar account. And once those funds have been fully received, then we will pay out the Australian dollar uh, equivalent from our Australian dollar account in Sydney to wherever you tell us to pay it uh, in Australian dollars. So, uh, uh, and th the same would be said for, for any other currency pair. Um, yeah, the, probably the other angle there is uh, different players have different models. <clears throat> our model is you can choose whether you want to book your transactions just yourself online or on your app without having to talk to any human, or you can phone us 24-7, 365 days a year, and we'll help you through if that's easier. And so, David, that answers your question. A uh, question from David uh, is, does OFX have an app? Yes, we do. I think um, you'd be in all sorts of drama as a, as a business in uh, 2021 without an app. So we most certainly do have an app, um, which is which is uh, widely used. So that almost brings us towards the end of the, the presentation. Of course, um, there's, there's a raft of, of information on our OFX website. So um, there's a, the, co the branded um, OFX and CPA website. Uh, landing page there where you can read all about OFX. Um, my my details are here, samuel.pit.ofx.com. Please um, um, get in touch. Um, always happy to jump on a call and, and talk about, you know, everyone's situation is different. There's no cookie cutter approach to any of this. So, um, you know, it's it's always terrific to to deal with our CPA and members and it's always, it's always an interesting conversation. And of course, you can follow us on uh, social at uh, OFX. Maybe I'll, you know, I'll ask, take the chair's prerogative and ask a sort of a, a probably a question you get asked asked all the time around where do you see foreign, foreign um, exchange rates heading? Um, we've got um, you know, Treasury U.S. Treasury yields sort of on the way up. Um, uh, China Evergrande, I think, uh, went into a trading halt yesterday. I'm not not sure whether if it's out of the trading halt. So, what, where do you, where do you see some of the um, major foreign currencies heading in terms of their values. You want me to have a start at that, Sam? I think so, James. <clears throat> well, the first and obvious answer, Gavin, is I have no idea. If you know, you're going to be a very rich man. But look, um, predicting rates can be very difficult. Uh, and I just heard some caution around if you ever if you're trying to speculate on FX rates, I mean, it is hard to know what's going to happen in the future. But over over the long term, uh, one trend that's happening, you know, internationally is that the US dollar is depreciating versus the Chinese currency. So that's that's one kind of long term systemic play. But day to day and month to month, it really depends on what's happening. Every time you see uh, the US Treasury making an announcement, or even you know the Reserve Bank of Australia has its quarterly kind of interest rates uh, announcement, you will see relationships between currencies jump up and down depending on what that news is. So you could you can subscribe to our newsletter which tracks you know what's happening in the market. It doesn't try to predict what will happen in the future, of course, but it might be helpful as you think through some of those things. Uh, we've got a, a question from Stephen Burns. Um, again, more speculative again. Um, where do you see digital currencies going? So I assume in the question, there's two aspects. There's the central bank digital currencies, and there's also uh, those um, other digital currencies like Bitcoin, or Arithium, and mm -hmm. currencies like that. Do you, so what are you seeing in that area? Um, 
in, in or for our sex point of view. Yep. Uh, again, very interesting topic to, to follow along. Firstly, on the central digital currencies, I mean, that's going to happen more and more. Each, each country's central bank will be, you know, focusing or investing on coming up with a digital currency. Uh, so that speed of transfer across countries is much more instantaneous. That's, uh, that's a sustainable real trend. The Bitcoin type currency, I don't know. Um, we've seen Facebook come out you know, a couple of years ago and say they're going to create digital currency themselves. And then they've kind of backed away from that. Uh, we've seen one South American country adopt Bitcoin just recently. You've probably seen in the news with lots of drama attached to that rollout. It'll be interesting to see where, where that goes. I think at the moment on balance, perhaps the commentary is, I'm guessing a little bit, but maybe 60%. It's uh, not, not really going to play out as a, as a permanent trend and 40% is. So it's, it's an evolving item that's happening and we'll have to see what happens into the future. At the moment, we yeah. don't offer any trading of, you know, the Bitcoin type currency. Where do you see, um, you mentioned about the time to make some transfers to certain countries um, with, with new payment technologies evolving. Do, do you see the speed of transactions speeding up or yeah. do you see some countries will continue to take a, a longer, um, a longer time, well, longer periods of time to allow transactions to occur? Yeah, a bit of both. Uh, so I'd say globally, the trend is opening up around allowing access to the fast rails, we call it rails, right? Um, and avoiding the old legacy SWIFT network, which is what banks typically do between each other, which can be, you know, T plus two type timeframes. But each country has got a different approach to it. In Australia, you need a certain type of license to access our fast rails. Um, and then that comes with more regulation and more capital commitments. You've got to put capital aside to access the fast rails. So I, I don't think every FX player will go down that path. There'll probably be more partnerships where a handful of, of FX companies or, or banks will have access to the fast rails and they will outsource access to other parties. Um, but definitely over, if you look at a 10 year window of time, it used to be two or three days was the average perhaps to facilitate a transfer, even on major currencies. And now commonly you're down into the same day territory. And in some cases you're even close to instant, depending on which rails you're hooked into. Yeah. And there's a question from Kaylee, and we sort of discussed this before, but what, what events Sorry, what events will influence uh, exchange rates? What sort of global events will influence yeah. exchange rates? Well, if you if you look at our 20 year history, uh, the biggest trading days we've had in the 20 years, number one was, I might've got the order mixed up, but when COVID first hit last year, that was a, a massively volatile period of time for the market with lots of frenzied activity happening. Brexit is another one, like particularly the first round of Brexit where the, the UK decided to leave Europe. That was very volatile, lots of activity, lots of trades being booked globally. And other things like the US elections, every time that rolls around, that creates a lot of volatility. Closer to home, things like Australian elections and even those global events like Brexit have an impact here too in our market. Yeah, I mean, day to day, somebody... you can get small volatility just from, um, you know, Chinese GDP growth will trigger a bit of volatility, as an example, whenever they make an announcement on that statistic. Yeah, I mean, just thinking of what I've seen, where that there's been major swings, and you you look at the collapse of Lehman Brothers as one of the one of the triggers. Yeah. Um, March last year when the pandemic really hit and 
the Australian dollar went down, I think went down below 60 US cents at one stage there last year, but quickly recovered. So there's, there's definitely key global events which influence prices. That's for sure. Absolutely, Gavin. And, you know, back in the days of Trump, all we had to do was sneeze and then, you know, something happened or or Boris Johnson, you know, had a big night out or, you know, all of, all of these seemingly innocuous, um, you know, happenings seems to always affect um, the currency. Absolutely. And we so, always have to keep an eye on what Elon Musk's doing and, you know, who's going to the moon next and, and that kind of thing, because all of these things do seem to... Uh, to have an impact. So James and Sam, so in, in terms of when you look at wake up in the morning and you think, oh, what's going to happen to the currency? What sort of things do you look at and read? Um, personally, do you want me to go first, Sam? So personally, the first thing I'd say is I don't actually focus a lot on what the currency exchange rates are because you can't control it. And I'm more focused on having fundamentals of your business whatever business you're in, in play, just to, to manage through that. Secondly, just to clue you up on what could trigger changes, it's just, you know, Fin Review, Australian Financial Review in the morning. Uh, there are a couple of, uh, I, I use Google Alerts a lot personally. If there's a topic I'm interested in, I create a Google Alert for myself and every day in the morning it sends you the top 10 articles and you can scan that list and jump in if there's something interesting there. And then we have internally, because we know all those um, events that typically drive currencies, we've got a calendar, which has got every date around the world of, of RBA type announcements that does tend to drive a change. So we know when they're coming up and we can get ready for that increased number level of activity. It's a good question, Gavin. Um, I, I tend to lean very heavily on our, our senior dealing team here at OFX, um, simply because, I mean, you know, if you want commentary on, on FX, you can get it there anywhere on the internet, of course, um, but, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm not biased here, I'm just, I'm saying uh, the commentary that's provided by our dealing team is some of the best in the industry. Um, so every morning I'm looking at that commentary um, to, to see, you know, what, what are the ranges of the day? Um, what, what, you know, where's the interbank? What are the major, um, you know, events around the world that are, are causing change. Because, like I say, I mean, I'm speaking to CPA members every day, um, and and invariably a question is, well, you know, what's the dollar doing? What's the what's the PHP doing? You know, should I? I've got sixty thousand dollars to move today. Do I do it today or tomorrow? Obviously, we can't, um, you know, um, have any sort of certainty on, you know, where the where the market's going. Um, but we can assist, you know, with um, with those you know hedging strategies or what have you or, you know even assist just by pointing the client in the direction of the good market commentary so um but of course you know it's always good to thumb through the afr every morning as well like james said and i think james made a good point around the business fundamentals and making sure you control what control what you can control so currencies you can you know, limit your risk exposure but you can't control what what happens exactly. so i think I think that's a great point by James. Uh, we've got a, a question from Peter Tan. I don't know if you can see it's in the chat box. Um, it may be more of a um, a question you might want to take offline with Peter. So I don't know if, if you can see it, Sam. Yeah, I can see that. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, if you could um, just send me an email, um, I can connect you with one of our or with one of our guys or gals in uh, in Singapore. Happy to do that. And also, so, Michael um, has a question about Swiss on happiness and euro. I think that's about one of the um, influences around um, uh, what uh, influences around currency. So there was an event. Oh, I can't remember when the Swiss um, Swiss Central Bank did something around uh, unpegging, or they they did something around the euro. I can't recall what that was. I know, James, if you can recall. I think I can see the question here, but um, I don't remember specifically what you might be referring to there. But uh, I guess generally, you know, we I did allude to the fact that some currencies are freely floating, some are tightly managed and some partially managed. Um, the 
CNY as an example, maybe it was a couple of years ago, it was just pegged to the US dollar. So it was very tightly correlated with US dollars. And then over time, they've now moved to pegging it against a basket, a much bigger basket of currencies. So that could be the similar type of theme that the question is talking to. So we're coming to the end, um, James and Sam, do you have any um, final observations that people can take away from this webinar? Maybe James, maybe a final observation. I think uh, with any topic, there's a, there can be a lot to learn. So if you're interested, just do some research. If you're time poor, find a partner that you can trust and, and just get them to do the, uh, the hard work for you. Thanks, Gavin, and, I, and thanks, James, for, for joining us today. My takeouts really, um, you know, for, for the currencies that we looked at today, um, just be very mindful of your, your transfers to China, making sure that you've, you know, fully across the CNAPS, you know, code. So there's nothing more painful than sort of being through and processing payment and then having to deal with failed payments and, you know, operational teams and all that so, so if you've got all of your information there you know it's really important that you get all of that clear same with your you know codes for indian payments um you know obviously like james said the, the good tip about um never transacting on the weekend especially in an exotic sort of currency uh framework because it's um you know it, it's just not a good idea if if sometimes it's not even possible um but at the end of the day, like you said, Gavin, you know, you can only control what you can control. The rest, um, you should just, um, you know, leave to the leave to the professionals. So, please, by all means, um, send me an email, give me a call, and I'm happy to happy to to assist. Well, thanks, James, and thanks, Sam, um, and also thanks OFX for sponsoring today's event. I'll now hand back to Lauren to finish off today's event. Thanks, Gavin. Thank you, James, Sam, and thank you, Gavin, uh, for your and everyone for your participation. In the next three working days, you'll receive an evaluation survey accompanied by the recording of this webinar. We really appreciate your feedback as it's extremely valuable to CPA Australia to help us deliver better events for you. Thanks again, and we look forward to welcoming you to another CPA Australia webinar soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys.